want to say hi to everyone in the crowd. Uh, I see a lot of friends from Hopkins too. And so I miss you all. And it's wonderful to see you doing some great stuff. So uh, it's my honor here to talk a little bit about immunotherapy for brain tumors. I'm going to just try to cover a couple concepts um, over the next 10 minutes. So uh, these are my relevant disclosures. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we've seen the, the reports from BMS that said that the large phase three uh, new in, um, trials for anti-PD-1 and newly diagnosed GBMs are um, not, are negative and it's matching this um, first recurrent study. And so there's been a lot of uh, dampened enthusiasm for immunotherapy. And so as we think about uh, mechanisms of immune suppression, it's clear that there's, this uh, mechanism is very different than other cancers. Um, the way we're thinking about resistance these days is that we go at, classified into intrinsic versus adaptive resistance. And if you look at intrinsic resistance, it's basically what the cancer cells have at the time to suppress an immune response. And for example, prostate cancers have high intrinsic resistance, which is why they're resistant to checkpoint inhibitors. Whereas with adaptive resistant, um, you know, for example, lung cancers respond well to checkpoint inhibitors, but over time become resistant. As much as 25% of those tumors become resistant. Unfortunately, glioblastoma has high uh, adaptive and intrinsic resistance. And so as we come up with therapies, we have to come up with idea uh, therapies to address both. Um, exhaustion is actually one that kind of um, straddles both of the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, resistance. And exhaustion simply means that a T cell loses its ability to kill, loses its cytotoxic function or cytolytic function uh, due to chronic stimulation, okay? And, and so if you look at the literature that's out right now, um, it is very well known that T cells uh, from a tumor, so if you take infiltrating lymphocytes, these T cells are exhausted. And the paradigm was that these T cells enter into the tumor, tumor does something to them, and then these T cells lose their ability to kill. This is uh, from Peter Fetchy's paper showing that these tills express low levels of interferon gamma and TNF alpha, which uh, again, are markers for satellitic activity. So <clears throat> a couple of questions I wanna address in today's call, um, today's talk, what is the mechanism behind exhaustion? Which cells are driving the exhaustion and is this exhaustion permanent? So exhaustion is actually an epigenetic phenomenon. It turns out that um, as uh, T cells are expressed to start, are exposed to certain signals, they become, if you look on the bottom part of this line, uh, they have a spectrum of becoming exhausted where they have a progressive, intermediate, and a terminally exhausted state. And there are things such as uh, TCF7, TB uh, TBX21, and uh, these uh, epigenetic targets actually push a T cell into exhaustion. Now, if you think about what uh, exhaustion is, right? It means that the T cells lose the ability to kill and why? And if you look, uh, oftentimes it's because T cells have alterations in metabolic function. For example, if you knock out the uh, ability for T cells to be glycolysis, and when these epigenetic changes do indeed occur, they actually lose that ability to do glycolysis. There's also other metabolic uh, pathways that are affected that I'll talk about in a second. Also, the membrane potentials of these mitochondria also become disrupted. And if you lose the mitochondria, you lose the engine to the T cells and those T cells stop working. So if you look, one of the things that um, I think are highly relevant to GBMs are the fact that glutamine and glutamate, uh, in terms of the met metabolism of these two uh, compounds are very affected and it's well known that there's high levels of glutamate in, in glioblastomas. And it turns out that it has, um, because of this metabolic change, there are two main effects um, on glioblastoma to help its uh, tumorigenicity. And um, on the first part is the, uh, this is Michelle Manji's work and she's kind enough to share this with me, but it turns out that if you have um, uh, high levels of glutamate, you can actually activate synapses and it turns out, and if you've seen Michelle Mondry's Nature paper, these uh, glioblastoma cells actually make synapses with neurons. And when these neurons fire, it actually promotes and propagates tumor growth. And you can see uh, from, this is Dr. Mondry's work, that these are actually synapses 
um, that are made with uh, tumor cells and neurons, and they are actually firing. And she showed that if you uh, actually, uh, I'm going to skip to the slide. If you actually uh, block those amphoreceptors and block the glutamate, you can actually slow tumor growth. But we were also interested uh, at the same time on the, the effects of the glutamate on T cells. And it turns out that there's glutamate receptors on T cells. And it turns out that if you, um, I'll come to this slide, I don't know why I went there. Um, it turns out that if you uh, modulate the glutamate receptors or glutamate concentrations, you can actually improve T cell function. And this is Ravi Medicanda's work when he was in my lab. Basically, we upregulated this EAAT receptor by a drug that was given to us by Biohaven. And it, he did microdialysis work to show that you can decrease the concentrations of, of glutamate uh, in the exercise space with this drug. You can actually see that there's an increased infiltration of CD4 uh, cells uh, into the tumor once you do that. And once you treat these animals with anti-PD-1, you can actually reverse the exhaustion. So there is a metabolic uh, um, uh, cause to this exhaustion. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was that mitochondria, again, are the engines that drive T cells. And this was a paper that just came out in, in science, uh, I mean, Nature Nanotech, and then um, there's a, another neuron paper. But on this slide up here, if you can see, this is a T cell and this is a cancer cell. And they actually build these nanotube um, structures that can actually latch onto T cells. And if you look at these T cells, they're actually pulling mitochondria out of the T cells to cause them to become exhausted. Essentially, it's like putting a straw in and sucking out the mitochondria. And if you look at these uh, electron um, microscopy slides, it's pretty cool. You can actually see these um, mitochondria being pulled out. And this is a, a, a paper that just came out in Nature Nanotech. I highly recommend reading it if you do. It's just a cool concept. Scary, but cool. And then there was a paper that was published by Vandermitt uh, Bilst. And they actually showed that macrophages can actually act as a bus to shuttle mitochondria between two cells. So mitochondria are essentially um, currency uh, for exhaustion. So what cells are causing the exhaustion? It turns out that uh, in glioblastomas, we all know, and we've heard the discussion that there's a predominance of myeloid cells and very few T cells. And if you look, just going back to the uh, basics of immunology, it turns out that myeloid cells aren't always just macrophages and microglia, which everyone refers to, but there's actually neutrophils and monocytes. But I think most of us, when we're trying to talk about myeloid cells is really talking about macrophages. And it's interesting, if you look at the different types of cancers, macrophages make up are the predominant uh, immune cell population. And it's actually a negative prognostic indicator um, if you um, look at macrophage density. Uh, on this uh, figure, you can see that the blue lines represent the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes are actually the minority um, population. So it turns out that uh, these myeloid cells are Jekyll and Hyde. They can actually promote tumor function through doing things such as proliferation and invasion and immunosuppression. But if they're programmed right, they can actually uh, facilitate tumor killing. So this is where that M1, M2 uh, uh, nomenclature comes from. But this is Christina Jackson's work when she, uh, when she was a resident at Hopkins. Uh, we worked with Drew Pardole and um, couldn't have done it without Drew Pardole and his support. This was a very expensive study, but we did single cell sequencing on about 22 GBMs. And what she is showing is that there are actually about 14 different um, myeloid subtypes, predominantly macrophages and microglia. And so it's not just M1 and 2 but there's a, um, it's a very complex uh, set of interactions that we have to understand. And through this time point curve, it actually shows that these um, macrophages can actually change phenotypes over time. Um, so when we're trying to target these myeloid cells, uh, what are we trying to do? If you look up here in the top left, this is an M2 phenotype, basically the immunosuppressive phenotype. Uh, Dr. Campson mentioned things like CSF1R inhibitors. You hopefully you hit it um, and you convert them to that tumor facilitating or tumor killing phenotype. And then they start doing antigen presentation and they start going down to the lymph nodes to start killing the, uh, to train the T cells to kill. Um, it also turns out that the lymph node is a very important organ. This was uh, Tomas Garza Mubdi's work. 
uh, showing that when you gave these myeloid uh, activators, the PD-1 only worked after you gave the myeloid activators because, again, the antigen presentation is occurring in the lymph nodes, but it's uh, those myeloid cells in the lymph nodes are actually still expressed in PD-1. So the PD-1 actually gets you over the hump, but it's not uh, getting you up the hill to kill cancer. So it's an important concept that, uh, uh, to understand and appreciate that the lymph nodes are probably a very important area in causing T-cell exhaustion. And so uh, John Choi, who was a resident in, here at Stanford, but a med student with me at Hopkins, showed that when we basically gave PD-1 and uh, delivered it locally to the lymph nodes, not to the brain, but to the lymph nodes, that you could actually get improved survival. And it's interesting, if you did the inguinal lymph nodes, you got even better survival. So um, again, we need to really understand that exhaustion is not just occurring in the tumor itself, but it's occurring outside. Now there's some therapeutic strategies to address this. Um, I've, you've seen some of my work here with LAG3. We found that LAG3 is another checkpoint that's expressed on uh, exhausted T cells. Uh, this was Sarah Harris Bookman's work and showed that the LAG3 positive T cells basically couldn't kill. But if you didn't have lag 3 and PD-1, these T cells could kill. We did um, preliminary translational work where we tre treated animals with anti-PD-1 and anti-lag-3, showed improved survival. And um, as a result, this is our preliminary data here. We then went to the ABTC, ran a trial, and actually got um, some really interesting responses. These are This is a patient who had uh, a GBM, it recurred, started on therapy, had classic pseudoprogression and, and disappeared. And um, it's, he's 40 months out. So we have four out of 16 patients that are um, well past 24 months. Three of the um, four are actually past 36 months now. And we're trying to go to the Alliance to do the large phase two. The last thing I just wanted to highlight was Michelle Manju's work. You may have seen it come out in Nature this, uh, this week. But you know when you can get T cells working and they're not exhausted, they can do some pretty amazing things. This was her work with uh, Crystal Mackle looking at uh, CAR T cells, uh, CAR -T -cells uh, uh, directed against GD2. Um, this was the preliminary data uh, or preclinical data showing that this could work actually uh, for patients with DIPG. Uh, Crystal Mackle made the CAR T cell here and the trial was run here where patients got um, CAR T cell infusions and uh, did it intrathecally. Um, here's an example of one of the patients who had a DIPG and it actually um, regressed and the patient's facial weakness improved. This was another patient who had, um, again, an H327, H3K27M mutant uh, uh, glioma that was in the spine. You can see the tumor regressing away. Uh, another one after uh, several infusions, um, you can see that the effects were quite dramatic and you can see that they uh, melted away. Here's another example of a 16 year old that um, just disappeared on. And um, in the paper, there's actually been, uh, we even show that the functional recovery of these patients are doing, are, are really quite impressive. Had a girl um, who came in with contractures and was riding her uh, little skateboard after. So um, I think once you can figure out how to get the T cells to kill that we can get very dramatic results. So in conclusion, you know, immunotherapies, have been disappointing thus far. There's high levels of adaptive and intrinsic resistance. Exhaustion is the major barrier and the mechanism behind this exhaustion is really probably due to some disruption of metabolic pathways and uh, the mitochondria itself. Uh, the myeloid cells are probably contributing to exhaustion and the exhaustion is occurring not only at the tumor but in the lymph node and um, this exhaustion can be reversed. Um, we just don't know how to figure out which cells are, can be reversed and which ones can't be. But when you do reverse them, the effects can be dramatic. I want to acknowledge that I worked with some really amazing postdocs and students over the years. Um, I want to acknowledge my clinical team at, at Hopkins that I worked with over the years, of course, the Stanford team and uh, this is my relevant funding. Thank you.